Welcome to JSA TV, where we're covering the latest stories, trends, and innovations from the leaders in global connectivity, digital infrastructure, and the networks within. And we are coming to you live from Times Square in beautiful New York City at DCD Connect. And I'm here with uh, who is soon to be my best friend here at DCD Connect, Mr. Bill Kleiman. Bill is the CEO of Apollo. Bill, welcome uh, to JSA TV. You are no stranger to JSA TV. No, not at all. That was one of the most energetic introductions I think I've ever had. Thank you so much, Gene. It is a pleasure <laughs> to be here. What's up, everybody live on LinkedIn? Hey, drop, drop a comment. I kind of know what this looks like. Right below, there's a like and a comment section. Yes, you can tell me I should have less caffeine. That's totally fine. But hey, Dean, it's really great to be here with you. There are like a million people walking around, so I'm so sorry if I wave at somebody. It could be you or it could be my friend Yuri over there. So thanks for joining us. Also, hi, Yuri. <laughs> um, so, Bill, speaking of, uh, of energetic introductions, why don't you introduce our audience to Greener Data? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm actually kind of glad this is the first question. Hang on a second. I, I'm facing the microphone in the right direction here. Um, all right, all right. I'm going to take it down like a little bit. So, uh, Greener Data is a really amazing project that started off, I believe, last year. It was, uh, it was That's a, right. It was a That's journey. Right. Yeah. Um, to get thought leaders from our industry to talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be honest with you, this, all of the stuff that you see, the way you're even watching this depends on data centers. So what we want to do is talk about what does greener data look like? How do we create an architecture that's more sustainable and share ideas and thoughts from brilliant thought leaders on what they're actually doing to establish that kind of infrastructure yes. Yes. and Drum roll! It was an Amazon bestseller, so it absolutely was. As will Volume Two, I can almost guarantee. Exactly. That. Yeah, so yeah. JSA said, "Hey, this is pretty good. Let's get some more brilliant thought leaders together and put together a second volume." Yeah. I'm I'm really excited about it. Our chapter, the one that I wrote, um, over the past year, I've been working in the space of AI and data centers, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about the stuff from like 20 years ago. By the way, it's literally <laughs> like the actual actual implementation. A deployment of the technology is happening right now. The most advanced technologies as that, well, Dean, like yeah. the generative AI architecture, yeah. you know, retrieval augmented searches, all the really crazy acronyms that even I sometimes don't know yet. Yeah. And I talked about that. A year of nonstop innovation. I had a chance to discuss everything mm -hmm. that we learned, what we learned in the data center industry, where there are leaders in the space, where there are, you know, sometimes lagging behind a little bit and how you can catch up. It's been an extraordinary journey. I, I'm so excited for this book to come out, to hear and read about the other um, the other thought leaders and what they put in there. But, oh, my goodness, if this is an opportunity for you to learn of how data and greeter data is, is going to impact you, especially on the AI front, you got to read it. Bill. That was the finest introduction to the Greener Data uh, project that I have, I have ever heard. Thank you very, very much. And thank you absolutely for your contribution to uh, the, uh, the next, the next uh, version, uh, edition of Greener Data. But aside from all of that, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned we, we don't let anybody leave the interview without discussing AI. You are no different. So let's talk about AI in the data center. What does AI in the data center even mean? Wow. Um, I know we don't have enough time here to go into all of the details, but you know, when we take a look at artificial intelligence, obviously AI is like the big name right now everyone's mm -hmm. talking about. But let, let's be perfectly honest, Dean, and everybody listening, AI has been around for like 20 plus years. Yeah. And the biggest difference right now is that, um, you know what, I'm going to use pup, pugs. Pugs is a way to explain the difference, right? In the past, traditional AI, now please understand, this is a very high level explanation. I love In the it. past, I would have Dean, I would sit down with him and I would show him picture after picture after picture of really cute pugs and French bulldogs. I do love I, French bulldogs. I, I, Allison likes French yeah, bulldogs yeah. as well. And, and so eventually I'm gonna take all those away and I'll ask, hey Dean, what do you think the next picture is gonna be? And Dean is gonna say, well, based on what you showed me, I bet it's gonna be a black Frenchie or maybe a fawn pug, just based on the stuff that you've shown me. now." Generative AI is exactly the same thing, except now I take all those pictures away and I go to Dean and I say, hey, draw me a pug. Generate original content. So that is the biggest shift that we've been seeing. Yeah. So old school legacy pattern-based recognition to something that we can generate. Now, before I go on, AI in the data center, why is this important? What we're experiencing is not a technology shift. It's a shift in humanity. Now, now please follow me on this for Thank a second. Thank you, Bill. It, yes. It's, it's an important yes. point to understand. You, 
me, Dean, we've been conditioned to interact with data in a very specific kind of a way. Dean goes to his favorite search engine, Alta Vista, Ask Jeeves, Yahoo, and if he's feeling feisty, maybe even Google. And <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe I can't believe I asked, ask Jeeves. If any of you remember that, drop a comment. Yeah, yeah. And um, he'll ask a question, and for twenty plus years, it's been a blue link. Yeah. A question and a blue link. God forbid that Dean ends up on page two of Google. That's like Mordor. Nobody belongs there. Yeah. And so, and so now, if you use Google and Bing in the past a few months, congratulations, you're a user of generative AI because the yeah. first response you get is a generative AI response. In the data center industry, what we've learned over the past year is that we have been working in this sort of 5, 10 kW rack. Now, if you're new to that, it's basically how much gear you can put into a rack. The challenge is that AI infrastructure is way, way more dense and requires you to rethink your environment inside of the data center. So all of a sudden, all of these data center leaders here thinking about AI are like, all right, hang on a second. I can't do business in traditional ways. I need to shift and shape in a different manner. The challenge for our industry and everybody, now this is from uh, one of my mentors, Peter Gross. All right, everybody. The data, <laughs> the data center industry loves innovation as long as it's 10 years old. Waka. No, that's right. We don't have 10 years. We yeah. barely have 10 months. That's how quickly this pace is evolving. Yes. So the question becomes, how do I impact my customers? How do I impact my, my use cases and my workloads? How do I shift my business to going from supporting email servers and exchange databases and pizza box servers to actually working with artificial intelligence? And that has been one of the easily the biggest impacts that we've seen on the data center industry is the challenge for them to understand how they can impact the market and where they can ship, uh, shift um, and shape that industry based on their requirements and their customers' requirements. Once again, an absolutely amazing uh, response to the question. Um, with all of that in mind, how, how the obviously monumental shifts in the infrastructure necessary to make everything that you just said happen, what does that look like? So I don't want to scare anybody. So we've taken on a, f a few. <laughs> We're already scared. <laughs> We're already scared. AI is coming for you. It's not. It's not. AI is not coming for you. Oh man, it's his life. We now, can't. We now, can't. Now, listen. If my dad sees this, he's going to be like that. Bill Kleiman. He knows what he's talking about. No conspiracy theories here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny. A lot of the things that we've actually built has been more, more like assistant levels. Um, but when when we start talking about uh, you know use cases and architectures around AI, you know what it means for the industries is, is a new way of thinking. It's a new yeah. approach to how we work with data, and and the challenge becomes how how do we better understand it? How do we better uh, apply use cases and technology? It's it's an extraordinary time to be uh, yes. to be in this space. Yeah, no, it really is. I was talking to my daughter. Uh, she's a sophomore in college, and and I was talking about AI. My my kids just kind of intuitively kind of know this stuff, and I'm just like, it took me a long time to figure this stuff out. Uh, but it, we were talking about it, and I said AI is going to be the thing, the engine that saves your dad's life one day. You know, because it, you know it, it may be it's the it's the augmented reality, it's the it's the machine learning, it's all of those things that are guiding the surgeon's hands, that are that are making the proper diagnosis, that are doing all of those things better infinitely better than we have ever done it before. Um, that's what that's what the future feels like and looks like to, to, to me anyway. It's, it's extraordinary. And you mentioned something really important. One of the things that we do at Apollo is that we, we listen, we can totally create an AI architecture that takes a unicorn riding a unicycle. Is that going to make you any money? <laughs> Probably not. So what we've been trying to approach is <laughs> we'll go to Dean and we'll say, what are you trying to solve from a business problem? What yes. data do you have? And then ultimately, what measurable outcome are you trying to get to? And then how do we use that data to use generative AI, all these new kinds of technologies to help you achieve something that you've never been able to do before? Yeah. In a big way, we want you to have that childhood sense of wonder. Remember how to dream again and broaden your imagination because that's what these technologies are effectively doing is they're eliminating your your limit of what you can do with data. Now, you can do cool things that don't make you any money. Yeah. That's, I guess that's fun. But what you can really do is apply these technologies to extraordinary use cases, saving lives, predicting yeah. energy costs with yes. levels of probability. Climate crisis. Being much more effective, being able to manage these kinds yes, of things yes. or see more deeply into environments. That's where AI could, obviously there's challenges and there's sure. faults and we can talk about the actual impact, the physical infrastructure impact on that. But from my perspective, 
I think AI is extraordinary. You know what? I'm so glad that you were, you were talking. We were talking about some generational shifts in thinking about technology, where it comes from, and all, and all of those kinds of things. I just had Phil and Nabil on from uh, NYI, the Nomad Futurists. Very, very fun conversation with uh, with those cats. Um, but that's kind of where we're going, right? I mean, it is it is um, it is it is the future generations that will really reap the the benefits of what's happening right now in the data center. So for those future generations, um, one of the things that I want to talk about. So everybody listening here, you are a user of generative AI, whether you know you yeah. like it or not. Yeah. Um, ChatGPT took five days to hit a million users. That's faster than any other application that we've ever seen in history. We don't have a precedent. Now, I'll caveat that with, I just lied to you because there was <laughs> one app, one app that hit, I think it was one million users in, I think it was five hours, Threads. Oh, interesting. Right, yeah. and that is the appropriate response because yeah. I don't really use it that much, I but ChatGPT, yeah. after just a few months, had over 100 million weekly unique users accessing the application. Yeah. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what that actually means from an environment perspective, right? Greener data, making sure that we support this. So follow me on this for a second. A single Google search can power a 100 watt light bulb for 11 seconds, okay? A single GPT-like instance, I say GPT-like because our company, we don't use ChatGPT, we yeah. develop our own kind of architecture, mm -hmm. but a single GPT-like instance is 600 to 800 times more powerful than a single Google search. Now, Unbelievable. now that Google stat, was from 2011. And when we do GPT-like searches and, yeah. and services, it's not just one query. They're done in processes and batches, six to eight, six to eight of them per process. One to two kilowatts of consumption per process. It is an extraordinary amount. Listen, every single time you enter in ChatGPT, you can charge uh, this phone 40 to 60 times. One time you ask it to make a really cute French bulldog Dali image. That's He's like done this before, I have done you? this before, and it's really <laughs> cute. Um, that will allow you to charge your phone at least one to two times. There is a massive impact that we have to understand, which is why here at this conference, why we're talking about our greener data, it's actually in the book in my chapter, the journey. We've taken many of these people here. This is something we say at Apollo from what to token in understanding how to restructure your environment. Now, Dean, before I let you talk, you said something. It's not scary to enter this. A lot of our data center partners have gone on a journey. A hybrid environment is the way to go. Rear door heat exchangers, better containment, better visibility into your environment. You don't have to like dunk your servers into immersion liquid cooling. I mean, that it's totally cool. If you I mean, want we to are going to talk about that later. <laughs> we are. But your method of entering into the AI space does not have to be scary. We've yeah. seen extraordinary yeah. success in taking data centers, traditional co-location retail data centers from 10, 15 kW into the 60 kW range. And they're like, cool, my building's still here. My customers are way happier, and yeah. I've got a new approach yes. to this technology. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm breaking all kinds of rules, but I was on a panel only because we're going long. Break and, them. Uh, Break yeah. those rules. Uh, and there's nobody here to beat me up or anything like that, I don't think, right? I Allison? don't see the virtual hook Allison, yet. Allison, I'm going to keep going. Is that okay? Cool. We're, Thank we're you. We're having fun. Okay. Um, so I was on a panel yesterday, and basically we were talking about colos and, the, and, and enterprise expectation on the colo with regard to AI. And I know it was deep. Heavy, heavy stuff. But from your seat, do enterprises really know what they're asking of the data center with regard to AI? Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fascinating. It fascinating to me. What, what a question. So um, Apollo, mm -hmm. we were recently launched. Yay, go team. We're, we're, we're a VC-backed, I would say startup, but originally we've been around since 2019. We had to move from Eastern Europe into the United States. So we're a restartup effectively. And what we've learned is that we are largely being driven by these enterprise customers. Right. They yeah. want data locality, proximity. They want to be able to control their costs. Yes. There's organizations like the government, healthcare, FinServe that sometimes can't put some of these AI and trading models into the cloud. They're absolutely driving the conversation. So right now, the challenge is an enterprise goes to a traditional co-location retail data center and says, you have my workloads. You have my SQL server, exchange boxes, VMware, Citrix, all this stuff. Now I want you to take my AI work. Typical response is, I can't <laughs> because a I don't yeah, have the, yeah. the software tool, mm -hmm. which you know what we do, and b I don't have the density level. Yes. Usually, if you're at ten to twelve kW per rack, and one Nvidia DGX node, it takes about six units in a rack, is about ten to twelve kW. 
So what are you going to do? Put one in there and a whole bunch of panels? Yeah. That's not going to look very good. Yeah. So these enterprises, they're hungry for capacity. They're hungry to work with trusted partners in the data center space outside of the hyperscalers. Now, Bill Clayman is not here saying that Amazon and Google and Meta and all of them are going away. Please, I'm not. There's plenty of market, but there is an extraordinary opportunity for funded startups, small, medium businesses, even large enterprises to leverage amazing relations with co-locations and data centers to support those AI use cases. And those use cases, Dean, and everybody listening, first of all, we don't have time to go over no, them all. Don't. There right. really is no limit. We've actually had to go back to customers and say, this is amazing. I don't know how you're going to make money on this, but yeah. this is an extraordinary use case. And we've gone back and said, this is amazing. Not only can you create this for your business, put your logo on it, productize it, sell it to your competitors. And they're like, okay. that's the kind of stuff we can create. Bill, we, we were out of time five minutes ago, but I tell you what, we, we're going to have to do this again. Absolutely, dude. All, all right. Absolutely. Th thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. You hey, bet. thanks, everybody. Yeah. And thank you, viewers, for watching JSA TV. Stay curious, stay connected, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.